Yes. Hi, Fiona. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Lynn, are you there? Yes, Lynn. Hello. Can you hear me, Lynn? Can you speak? That's how we do. That's the problem we had yesterday. We can't hear. Okay. Yes. Yes, they can hear us. But we can't hear them. That's because they're just saying it until we do questions on show. And even if they, oh, even if we like, can't hear them, they can type their question. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you can hear. Sorry, the setup yeah. is slightly different from yeah. a normal Teams I meeting. Think. Yeah, exactly. Because. Yeah, perfect. Right. I'm okay. going to trust that it's going to work. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Because this Teams meeting is set up slightly differently, that's why this bit confusing. Oh, looks good, says Lynn. Right, we have about two minutes, so we'll let people uh, join um, and then we'll give us off. Yes, you were here for the drama yesterday. Yeah, absolutely, I was in that stupid lion place. Hi, I'm Alex. Who have you met? Hi, uh, I'm Jason. I'm Mike Lonergan. Hello. And yes, we have me. I knew, uh, yeah, I think I've seen you. You were just so far. Yes, I did. I knew you were just so far. In late back. Sound from the floor isn't great, so please make sure the speaker is yes, I think the mic is <laughs> the mic is. <laughs> we can assume the mic is yeah, assume it's or it might be in the laptop. Yeah, see the laptop or there. Okay. I think it's in the bar. Yeah, so the test. <laughs> scream at the screen. It's now all there. It's now all there. No. Okay. Right. Are we on screen? Am I on screen? You Ah, oh, yes. Right. Yeah, if you yeah. stand somewhere. If I stand somewhere here. That's still fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I've got, sorry, everybody. Anyway, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming today to our seminar. Um, and sorry for this slightly odd setup. We have new equipment and it's finally working, but we're still learning how to use it. Um, so we have plenty of people in the room. We have plenty of people online as well. And it's also been recorded. So and you've given me permission for that. So everybody can also um, Anyway, so we're very pleased today to have um, Greer Jarrett here from the University of Lund, who's working on a PhD um, on sort of the experimental approach to vitamin C roots. And of course, Shane and I, and working with some German colleagues on a project on sort of North sailing communication routes. We thought we wanted to hear more about um, Greer's research. So um, I'll just hand over to you. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Alex, and thanks for having me here. It's really nice to be here. Um, my name is Greer Jarrett, and yeah, I'm a PhD student at the Department of Archaeology and Ancient History in Lund, in Sweden. Um, and I'm currently on a kind of grand tour of Scotland a little bit to visit a few people I've been in touch with throughout my research. Um, and I really wanted to come here and, and talk to you guys because the North Sea project and, and things that we have in HHI. Um, so I'm going to try and condense everything I've done over the last four years into 40 minutes, which is going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, but mainly I wanted to kind of divide it into two. Uh, just that. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit at the beginning about um, Kind of some of the problems with the Viking Age and approaches that, that I see at the moment, um, the approach that I've taken, which is kind of more experimental, and some of the results from that. 
and then also talk a bit more specifically about um, harbors and havens along the Norway coast. I know you guys have been working on that and how I've gone about trying to locate some of those. So, so yeah, first a bit more kind of up in the air, world views and that kind of stuff, and then we'll look at some actual places later on. A bit more generally, um, I've tried to kind of orient my research um, towards a kind of writing about sailing from the sea um, and writing about sailors' perspectives of sailing, which is very difficult to do from a kind of scholarly background, I think, because our academic tradition is so entrenched in the land and the kind of terrestrial points of view on the world. So one of the big challenges has actually been how do you communicate that knowledge to people sitting in a room on land, like here. Um, so you can tell me whether I managed to do that or not. Um, and then a bit more generally, um, I think I'm, this project is kind of trying to move away from like bird's eye view, very dualistic points of view on the Viking Age and on Viking Age thought, I guess. I'm very interested in contextualism and in what people do in the moment, practically and in their brains. Um, and also the idea that this is an extremely mobile period and an extremely mobile set of communities who spend a lot of time moving along the sea routes. And so trying to make movement kind of the norm rather than a kind of special part of the Viking Age as well. Um, just some kind of general ideas I've had. When it comes to the Norwegian coast uh, in the Viking Age and later as well, there's a general kind of movement. Will it follow me? Maybe not. Okay, I'm going to awkwardly point from over here. Um, a general movement of goods and people and ideas from the Arctic and from the continent going up and down the coast here. And you don't need to memorize all of these names, don't worry, but just kind of get the idea that a lot of the wealth is very, very far north, whether it's ivory or cod or feathers or whatever, um, and is coming down from the far north into the markets, and at the same time, stuff from the continent is going all the way up this coast. And this is a really long coast. Um, it takes a very long time to, to do it. So along the way, people are obviously stopping um, along at kind of harbors along the way, but we don't really know where these are. Um, and there's also lots and lots and lots of islands. So it may look like quite a simple route, but actually your possibilities of taking different routes is massive um, because of all these islands. So, so exactly where they went and where they stopped are the kind of big questions, but also what did doing these routes and spending so much time on the boat going up and down this coast do for your brain? And, and, and what, what kind of maps and mental maps did people kind of generate um, through this activity? So, so those are my kind of three big research questions. What routes did they take? Where did they stop? And, and what kind of mental maps were generated because of that? And that's been historically quite a difficult um, subject for archaeology and I would say academic tradition in general to tackle. And I think this goes back to kind of a much older clash in worldviews between the people doing the writing and the people doing the sailing. Um, and you can see it here in, in Alcuin's letter, which I think is a bit more than just hyperbole, where he literally says he didn't think this could be done at all, you know, and this could just be kind of dramatic effect. But I think there really is a, a contrast of ways of thinking between um, the kind of Christian tradition on land and a much older, perhaps, um, tradition of, of thinking about the sea from the sailor's perspective. And in archaeology, um, this normally results in things like this, where we say, OK, yeah, this is where the Vikings were, and we get a whole bunch of dots on a map. Um, or, OK, this is where all of the insular artifacts are in Norway, and we put a bunch of dots on the map there. Um, or if we're lucky, we might get some arrows. Um, so kind of Oxford history, Atlas of the Viking Age, a bunch of bold arrows going down, down the coast there with some cute little boats. Um, and then Barry Cunliffe in 2017 it was like, oh, I'm going to be radical and turn the map sideways. <laughs> Um, but that's maybe as far as you get, really, in, your, in, in the normal um, approach. And as you can probably appreciate, um, the sea itself and the movement itself is basically lost in these cases. There's no, no information about where, um, where they stopped, no information about um, what the sea was like. So, so can we do better than this, really, is a question. 
Now, that is actually tricky because stopping off and, and the roots themselves are completely invisible. Okay, let's check. Um, so here we are kind of tying up our boat, which I'll talk about in a while, um, to a rock with some ropes. Um, and then we put the sail down and sleep under the, under the sail. So there is nothing left on land. We're cooking on the boat. Um, and obviously we take the ropes with us when we're done. Um, so, so the kind of one instant of mooring on this rock is, is lost to history entirely. The only way we can kind of um, hope to find these things is if there's a tradition of repeated use. And obviously once someone goes there, and does this, and they say, oh, that's a really nice rock to buy your boat to, um, then someone else would probably go back and do it again. And over time, if there's repeated use, then then things build up and an infrastructure develops. So, so when I talk about havens, I'm talking about places on the layer, on the kind of traditional sailing route up the coast, um, which are used more than once. Um, and importantly, which are not kind of outposts. They've got to be things that go to somewhere and things that lead on to somewhere else. So in Norway, you get these there, which are kind of fishing stations way out on the West Coast, um, which are kind of very nice harbors often, but they don't lead anywhere. So because I'm interested in this kind of more trans-regional connectivity that I'm, I'm interested in places that lead you somewhere else. So not just destinations. Um, and eventually some of them become markets, some of them become towns and things like this. Um, but I'm interested in finding the ones that maybe didn't get that far, but that might still have some, some archaeological remains. Luckily in Norway, there's a kind of incredible continuity in, in traditional sailing um, and in the kind of fishing industry as well. So these are photos from the early 20th century where in Northern Norway and the cod fisheries, they're still using wooden boats with sails um, and they're still kind of packaging all of the goods in similar ways. And the boats even have square sails still. So this is a yak bigger um, cargo boat um, from Norway, which is built in a similar tradition to how boats were built in the Viking Age and rigged with the same sail. Um, so the continuity and practice and in the kind of subsistence economy is, is quite amazing. Even in the landscape, um, places are very similar. This is Borgs Øya on the west coast of Norway. Um, and you can see that roads are really not a possibility even today, there's just no place for them. So the towns or the kind of settlements you get are these boat sheds along the coast. Um, and that is almost it, basically. So you can still find places like this. Um, we got there and it was completely deserted, no one there. Um, so so today they kind of often fall out of, loop, of use a little bit, but they look the same still, which is important. And you get to these places um, on your small um, fishing boats often, and these boats that I'm going to show you now are from a tradition in central Norway in Trondelag called Orfjord's Water, um, which are from a place called Orfjord, um, and they are seen to be the kind of closest equivalent to boats from the Viking Age, but in a tradition of usage from the kind of 19th and early 20th century. So there, the, a lot of the reconstructions of Viking Age boats that are done later on draw on the wrecks, obviously, but are also inspired by this tradition because the sails on those wrecks are going to survive and, and the rigging didn't survive. So, so they've drawn on this tradition a lot. My take on that was, well, why not just use the 19th century tradition where we know what the boats were like in their entirety and we know what thing, what people did on board and what the names for everything are and go back from there. And you can agree or disagree with that, but um, they are extremely similar to what we know of kind of Viking Age boat building, I would say enough, similar enough that for a project like this, which is about voyages and not about boat building, there you can make an analogy and say, well, if you could do this in this boat, then it probably would work in a Viking Age boat. There are differences though, of course. Um, you may notice that these boats, um, they have a rudder on the stern at the back here. And famously, Viking Age boats have a side rudder to starboard here, hence the word starboard. Um, so there have been, of course, developments, um, and they're much kind of curvier, the Viking Age boats, whilst the later boats, they have much kind of stiffer stems there. So, so there, there are definitely differences. But as I say, because I'm not kind of a boat builder or a boat building specialist, um, I, I'm kind of ignoring those a little bit. Um, to, to kind of do a bit more analysis, I've done 3D models of all of the boats that I've sailed on. Um, and I'm comparing kind of hull shapes on different boats to see 
um, whether the performance that I've seen in different boats is due to differences in the construction. Um, and they end up something looking something like this. So these are some of the boats that I've used. And you can see that in comparison with the Viking Age boat, uh, they are different. So the Viking Age boats are often a bit broader. Um, and this is kind of scaled down so that it fits as well as possible. So, but um, but there is there there has been a kind of development in the tradition because the fishing boats are rowed a lot as well. So you want them to be kind of long and narrow. Um, and in profile, they are really quite similar there. So you can see, and that's what affects the performance um, the most. Really, is kind of the 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 profile of the boat and how it interacts with resistance in the water. And in that case, lots of similarity. So I'm hoping that will kind of reflect well back in time. All of this is to say, basically, that um, because of these continuities and practices in an environment, um, I think that we can kind of use these to reconstruct voyages in the past. But we have to do that by creating kind of authentic um, voyage reconstructions to suggest which harbors might have been used. And what does that mean? What is an authentic voyage? Well, you can be as Puritan as you like and kind of choose your variables a little bit. Ideally, you have an authentic reconstruction of a boat following an authentically historically documented route, and you use only natural harbors, um, you use only navigation, traditional navigation methods, and no engines and no towing. And very important not to have a timetable as well, because the minute you say, I'm going to be here at this point, it never works out. Um, and then you can go further and say, well, I only want to use traditional clothing, or et cetera, et cetera, only traditional food. Um, my experience is that the more variables you put in, the less likely it is for things to succeed. So it's much better to pick a few and say, OK, we're going to do these, um, but we're not going to bother, bother so much about those. That's also really important that people on the boat are safe. So kind of, we have some modern safety equipment on board. So we have a VHF radio and a life raft, and we wear life jackets, for example. So some people might think that that's breaking the, breaking the spell, but I think you know, I'd rather live through this project. Uh, um, and eventually this has ended up with me sailing about two and a half thousand nautical miles, um, not just on the west coast of Norway, we've also done stuff down in the Danish islands and across the Baltic and various other places. Um, and I focused on seven different boats that I've used, um, all of which are from the same off-road tradition in Trendelag. Um, and on board, as I was saying earlier, I've tried to not be the kind of arrogant scientist sitting in the back um, and have been involved. And even in some cases, I've been kind of skippering the boats as well. So. So I've been engaged in the sailing as well as the data gathering, which is sometimes a bit stressful. Um, and this has resulted in kind of a, a whole bunch of trials that we did. I tried to divide the project into sailing trials at the beginning, where we got to know the crew because the crew are all volunteers. Um, and we tried out the boats in different environments and over kind of throughout the winter to see um, how they worked and, and like got some experience with them. And then we did these longer voyages, um, first of all, up to Lufthansa and back, and then down to Bergen, and since then I've done some others. Um, once we kind of knew what we were doing and which bit went forward, um, so it's been a really fantastic experience. Very cold a lot of the time, um, but has kind of let me understand a lot about what the potentials of using these kind of boats are. And then we've done some kind of fun little experiments where we've tried kind of sailing against the wind, which is something that famously these boats are not meant to be very good at. 44 tacks later, we decided that it could be done, uh, but it's a lot of work. Um, and then we did some capsize training as well and tried like what happens when these boats sink and how the sites form and all this kind of stuff. So there's me emptying the boat out after we capsized it just before I got hypothermia. Fun times. Um, and during all of this project, all of this process, what I'm doing is I have um, a, a kind of log of the voyage where I've decided on a bunch of variables before that I didn't include here, I'm afraid. Um, but basically, I have a four hour log every four hours, I fill in all of this information. Um, and then I'm taking photos and filming, interviewing people in the crew. Um, I have some kind of fancy weather machines that can tell me about the wind direction and wind speed and that kind of stuff. And then, as you've seen, the, the 3D models of the boats once we're back on land safely. Um, so that's, that's the kind of data set itself, um, which I'm working from. So the trials themselves, as I say, on the west coast of Norway were in uh, April and May of 2022. We sailed from Risa near Trondheim um, up to Luften and back over about three weeks um, on a boat called a Femboding, which is a bigger kind of 15 meter long traditional fishing boat. 
and then from this uh, down to Bergen um, in like June and July. Mm, yeah, June, mainly June, bit of July, um, down to Bergen um, in a smaller feeding, um, a kind of traditional uh, fishing boat as well. And on those trips, my goal was, okay, which of the harbors that we use might have been used in the Viking Age as well. Some of the ones that we located and I thought, oh yeah, definitely, um, turned out not to be true and you'll see that in a minute. Um, but I think I found four or five that are often known beforehand, but that haven't been excavated, um, which I think might be useful. So this voyage is kind of the traditional route that the cod fishers take to, to go and do the cod fisheries in the winter, um, which went on until the kind of 1920s. Luckily, we were able to do it in the spring, which was meant to be better, but it still rained and snowed for 15 of the 17 days. Um, but, but we followed two different routes on the way up and down to look at kind of an, a, a more inner route, kind of like you have in the Hebrides as well, and, and a kind of further more outer route on the way back um, to, to, to see kind of, well, what is actually safer and what, where is there more possibility for a shelter and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the Bergen voyage we had, there we go. The Bergen voyage, um, we had kind of less good luck with the weather, so it was a lot slower, but that also meant that we used a lot more harbors, um, and especially in areas where there is still quite a lot of unknowns about where people stopped because there's some quite exposed junk to the coastline, Hustavika start places like this, um, and we found some possible spots for, for that as well. So I'll show you those. But I thought I'd show you a bit of footage, if we can, a couple of bits of video, um, so you get more of an idea of what it's like, um, and so that the kind of very up in the air ideas that I'm going to throw around later make a little more sense. So I'm going to press play and see what happens. Yeah. This is June, um, and we're going around that point. We're kind of out on the ocean. So mainly there, I just wanted to show how much everything moves. Obviously, how terrible the filming becomes because of that as well. But um, but to show that the boat, in relation to the landscape and to the sea, is kind of in constant motion, really. Um, and and the, the the sea itself is definitely not the kind of flat blue surface that you get on these maps, but rather a kind of really dynamic environment as well. Um, and then this one here is from those the the tapping attempts that we did last year. And this is just to show you kind of how the maneuvers work a little bit and how many people are involved in what we're doing. And as the Scandinavian speakers will expect, we'll see most people knew what they were doing. So here we're tacking. So the boat has to go up into the wind. So we're going to go that way and then we're going to turn around and we're going to go back kind of the other way. So we're going to turn to port left that way. Um, Now the wind goes into the back of the sail and it pushes the boat around. So it's kind of like a three point turn in a car. You can see the boat's going backwards now. Turn around the wind.
and that goes physically pulling the sail forward. Bring it around. <laughs> this is actually a, quite an experienced crew, but I got a little confused. <laughs> Uh, and then you gather the speed before you go back up into the wind there, so you don't just drift sideways. There you go, and we're off. Okay. So yeah, just to show you a little bit about the kind of collaboration between people. Um, so these trials kind of got me thinking about a whole lot of different stuff. Um, and I've kind of tried to narrow this down into a few points that I think are important for thinking about where these havens might be. Um, the first of these is about where you need to stop and where the danger is. And I think we're very focused Day and looking at places like this and going, oh yeah, this is really dangerous because it's big rocks against the coast and the waves are crashing and everything. Um, we found it actually okay as long as you were further away from the coast because the, the, the sea is much deeper at that point. So the waves aren't as steep um, and you don't get these kind of falvin, the wind that comes off the mountain and goes kind of straight down. Um, so for these very light boats, it's actually a bit safer to be further out. Um, the real danger we found often was in the fjords, um, where you get kind of really strong current and riptides even sometimes, and then the kind of shallower sea water depth means that the, sea the waves are a lot steeper and you get this nasty wind coming kind of off the mountain. So my take is that people are waiting sure for going around the kind of very exposed parts, but they're also probably waiting before they go into the fjords to have good conditions there, which means the havens are probably kind of somewhere in between as links between these two places, because the conditions often change a lot when you go into the fjords, and so you might want to check and stop there beforehand, um, but you might also want different conditions to go into the fjord because the fjords are kind of windy and they go in different directions and stuff like that. So, so I think thinking about this kind of transitory zone between the exposed areas and the inner areas with dangers of different kinds in both places is important. Um, we sailed at night quite a lot and in the summer in Norway that's completely doable. This is like 2 a.m. I think um, in yeah 2 a.m. in kind of late May um, and even though the sun's gone down there's enough light even for the camera to, to see so so my take on night sailing is that if the wind is good and you're not kind of super knackered then people would definitely do it um the interesting thing was the weather and thinking about kind of what weather conditions are, are most favorable because in the sagas but also in modern texts you often get this idea of yeah they use favorable weather or fair winds you know but what does that actually mean and we found that this was much safer than this, even though they look the opposite. So here you've got really unstable conditions because you have snow really close to the water. And so the temperature difference is really high and you get these kind of gusts of wind and also kind of showers or squalls of rain um, in in kind of very sudden um, place, very small areas very, very suddenly, which means you can't really predict what's going to happen. Whilst here, sure, it's raining and it's horrible, but it stayed the same for two and a half years. Big fight. So, so I think we have to rethink a little bit what we mean by fair weather and fair winds, um, and think about kind of stability and predictability more than okay, yeah, sure, it was great here, but five minutes later we got attacked by hail and we could kind of take the sails down and all kind of stuff. So, so especially if you don't have a weather forecast, which I think is the kind of the biggest <coughs> deal breaker with modern sailing. Um, you want conditions that might not be perfect, but that you know we're going to stay the same for a while. Um, in terms of navigation, I'm not going to talk about instruments and all that stuff because I don't think they were used anyway. But if you look at kind of older charts, even in the 50s, they're still doing these kind of um, kind of perspective from the sea to, so that you can see where the landmarks are. And that's 
what we used often and was really useful um, was kind of looking at the landmarks, which often have very unique names and, and kind of Arna and Alan and Edinburgh talk about that a lot. Um, but getting that kind of view from the, from the sea and seeing the outline of the mountain um, is really all you need because basically for the whole whale on the coast, you've got a kind of very steep coastline with kind of specific landmarks that help you know where you are. Um, and what this results in really is a kind of chain of places that you remember that you go past again and again. So here's our sailing trials in the Trondheim Fjord. Um, and you can see that we're going past this headland, which is Alsnes, which is here again and again and again. And we go past it in loads of different conditions and you remember it in lots of different ways. And it kind of sticks in your brain. Um, and one of the really interesting things when talking to people in Peru was that people went from saying, OK, it's going to take us 20 miles to get here. Um, and then, you know, I'm just talking about kind of start and end points. And as we sailed past it again and again, people would start saying, well, OK, it will take us this many hours, I'm talking about time, but also in a kind of sequential way. Yeah, we'll go past the nest to port, and then we'll go past this place to starboard, and then we'll get there, you know? So, so you create this kind of chain of memories in your brain, um, which creates a very different way of thinking about, about the seascape than, than what you would do if you just looked at a nautical chart. Um, and there's often not much to do on the boat. So you sit around and you talk a lot of the time as well. And it creates this kind of really strong social bond between people, which you could see also in the attacking video where everyone's kind of collaborating a lot. Um, so, so the kind of social side of things, I think, is super important as well. And it extends onto people who are on land as well, who you meet along the way and who tell you about, well, if you go this way, you know, there's, there's a secret channel that you can use. And, uh, and that kind of social aspect of, of, of the, the sailing, I think, is often forgotten as well. And sometimes it's horrible. If you have a crew who don't trust each other or who don't know each other, then it can mean that the voyage is much more dangerous. Uh, but if you have a decent group of human beings who kind of know what they're doing, then then you can do quite incredible things, I think. Um, and we don't we don't talk about the kind of collaboration side of it as much. Ultimately, I think it comes down to a question of judging whether the risk is acceptable. That's how you navigate. Is and this is from a text in the, from the 1200s, um, where there's a bunch of Danes who weirdly go to Norway on their way to Jerusalem, um, but they they um, get shipwrecked, and they get shipwrecked because their ability to rightly judge the route and the sea. Uh, this is the Norwegians who don't get shipwrecked. Sorry, so the Norwegians don't get shipwrecked, and their ability to rightly judge the route and the sea was reliable thanks to their long experience and frequent sailing. And I think that's exactly right. Like what you what you need to be able to succeed is to know whether in the current circumstances the risk is acceptable or not. Obviously, that's horrible and for archaeologists because it's almost impossible to model and it's all about kind of subjective decisions and all this stuff. But but I think we have to think about sailing in this way um, and not as a kind of predictive calculation in any way. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work and you end up kind of shipwrecked or capsizing or whatever. This is from last year when one of the femurings in northern Norway um, capsized. And that seems to have been, I've heard from secondhand from the skipper, that she had a crew of people who were completely inexperienced. And she was the only one who really knew what she was doing. And they were had really nice, calm conditions and everyone was really relaxed. And suddenly they went past the headland and they got one of these falvins coming off the mountain and it just pushed the boat over. No one was hurt, everyone was fine. And the, this is from the um, search and rescue helicopter. So they, they got there really quickly. Um, but that kind of social dynamics and the people not knowing how to judge what might happen is what put them in the water in the end. Um, so all of those ideas together, I've kind of tried to package um, and kind of thinking about Westerdahl's maritime cultural landscape. Um, I'm calling it a maritime cultural mindscape. Um, which is almost academic piracy, I'd say. Um, but basically with a few kind of ideas in mind about how these mental maps might come together. I think this idea about having these kind of memory pegs, as Stefan Brink calls them, these kind of named places um, as a kind of chain in your brain is super important. And obviously the big ones along the coast are shared by everyone. So if you talk about stuff to anyone in Norway, they know what that is. And that gives you a way to communicate. And between these points, you have a whole bunch of different routes that create a kind of meshwork or, or kind of tangential um, um, kind of navigation system, um, which come together 
in a, in a kind of idea of the sea, but as a completely unbounded space. And that's, again, really tricky for archaeology to think about because there's no edge. Um, even the edge of the, the shoreline, it moves because of the tide and people live on land, so they're moving beyond the edge as well. Um, so we've got to think of kind of like a boundless space, which is difficult. Um, and, and other than the names, the thing that kind of ties people together is that they all know how to use these folks. And it's about using the kind of this kind of tradition of usage where people come together in knowing what they're doing physically. Um, because there's no kind of absolute unit in this map, um, things are based on averages on a kind of collectively held average. And we still do that today. So we say kind of, oh, it's an hour's drive away. And that only makes sense if you all think, okay, the car goes at maybe 50, 60 miles an hour and blah, blah, blah. So, so that there, even in the book bit, bit building is, itself, everything is proportional, often to the body. So the kind of normal unit is the RLM, which is your kind of elbow to your hand for building the boat. Um, and at sea, it's time. Um, so we're talking about kind of proportional measurements based on an average system, um, and which is all oriented from the boat itself. As I say, you're, as and you saw in the video, you're kind of the landscape seems to move around you as you go along, um, and ultimately you make these decisions based on what you perceive the risk to be. Obviously, there are often risks that aren't there, um, such as kind of mythological risks, perhaps, and also risks that you don't see because you've maybe not experienced enough, or 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 you don't have the instruments for it. Um, so all you can do is kind of what can I perceive, and is that acceptable or not? So that's my kind of theoretical package. Let's talk a little bit about havens themselves. So what I've tried to do here is, and this is all unpublished, just so you know. Um, what I've tried to do here is I've taken the um, the first data set of isostatic rebound in Norway, which is the ice coming off the land, and the land therefore kind of rising up out of the sea. Um, so the first complete data set for Norway was published two years ago um, by Creel et al. Um, and they have made that publicly available. So I've tried to look at these harbors that I identified along this route um, and, and looked at what they would have looked like in the Viking Age with a sea level from that time. So I'm going to show you a few of them and we'll try and pick out some kind of trends in there. As I say, some of these are well known, some of these are less known, let's say. This is Sturfusna, um, on the outside of the Trondheim Fjord. There is a little map in a minute. Um, but basically, you go out the fjord and there's this big island, um, which looks completely forbidding from the outside. It's got big kind of rocks on all around it. But in the middle is a lagoon. And I'll say lagoon a lot in the next few minutes. Um, so you go in through a really tiny channel, um, and it's completely calm on the inside. And this existed in the Viking Age as well. So I'm going to show you two maps every time. So one's from the 800s and one's from 1200. Um, so it's just here outside of Trondheim. And today, there's only one entrance. In the Viking Age, it seems like, sorry, I should explain what all of this is. Orange is the um, land as it was in the Viking Age. The white line is the coastline as it is today, although it's a bit dodgy. Um, and the colored line is our GPS track of our boat. So, so you can see this stuff over here, which is land now. There's also a breakwater there now, was not land in the Viking Age. So there would have been another entrance, which is interesting when you're thinking about people coming down from the north. It's a touch screen. Yes. Go on. <laughs> Uh, 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 go back on can I go back and just do that? Yes, great, great. Um, so, so you've got these two entrances, um, one from the south if you're coming in from Trondheim, and one kind of from the east um, if you're coming down from the north, perhaps, and this really calm lagoon in the middle. There's a big um, Merovingian period grave up here and a later kind of royal manor or farm woods um which which kind of had some royal sanction as well um and a couple of finds from the viking age there so so it seems like used at that point um but interesting when we're thinking about kind of approach areas and fjords it's outside the fjord after a really exposed bit of the coast when you're coming down from Dervig and these places um but before you go into the kind of current filled areas in in the interior um 
Another example here is Björnsund, which is a much smaller set of islands. It is a kind of fiskever today, one of these like fishing stations. Um, and it was actually, everyone was moved out in the 1970s. Um, but you can see again, this kind of really protected little harbor um, with space to bring your boats in. Um, at the end of another bit of exposed um, coast, Hustavika there. And in the Viking age, a lot of the island was still there. So you still had kind of protection on th at least three sides and a nice little harbor in the middle, both at the beginning and towards the end of the Viking Age there. Um, Fusnavog, which is famous because the Kvalsun boat, if anyone knows what that is, was found in a bog over here. Um, and there is a harbor that I'm going to show you is on the left hand side here. Once again, a little lagoon in the middle, kind of narrow entrance into the lagoon. Um, and all more or less in place throughout the Viking Age as well, with this nice island to stop um, to protect it from the from um, the northerly winds as well. Quite hidden as well. Often you you can't really see the entrance here, so that might be something to think about in terms of visibility as well. Um, and I think finally this one, which is Smurham, which is, means butter harbour, which I think is a great Norwegian name. Um, for a kind of slightly built up area here. And you can actually see the difference in the sea level here. There's a noust here that's built, that's now above the high tide mark. Um, and you can see how that's changed there. But this is one of the places that the yachts, the big kind of cod cargo boats that came down from northern Norway, they would stop here um, on their way down to Bergen and wait for the wind because they're completely wind dependent. So it's been used continuously ever since. Um, and you get again, this kind of little sheltered area um, with kind of and a kind of um, oh, I've touched the screen again. <laughs> there we go. Nice sheltered area after start after the kind of exposed part there before you go down into Bergen and the fjords further down. Um, one of the ones that I was like, oh yeah, this is definitely a Viking Age harbor is this one, which is Tarva. Um, you can see so that's Trondheim Fjord is going in that way again, so it's kind of on the entrance point there. But when you look at it in the Viking Age, most of it's underwater, especially in the early Viking Age. So you only get these three little yellow blobs, which were the rocks that were out in the in the Viking Age. The rest of it would have been underwater. So probably not in that case. But you but I saw this kind of lagoon area and I thought, oh yeah, definitely, but perhaps not. So my kind of vague conclusions for that are that these havens are kind of connecting dangers, connecting areas of exposed coast with areas that are also dangerous kind of in the in the inner fjords um, that you can get in and out of in as many conditions as possible. And that's important as well, that because of islands, if the wind is blowing from here, you can go out that way. If they're on the mainland, you can't always exit in as many directions. So they give you lots of alternatives, which is super important. But at the same time, they provide kind of protection from lots of different wind directions. So you get these kind of lagoon areas or kind of inner lochs, which, which are really well protected. Um, and some way of loading and unloading goods. Um, often in these cases, there isn't a beach, but there's a rock. And as you've seen, that's that's enough. So so I think the kind of landing place idea is perhaps not so much what's going on here, um, but at least there's kind of a mooring place with fresh water and places that are now at least two and a half meters above sea level. Because if not at that time, although there is variation in the in the rebound, I'm taking that measurement as a kind of general rule that otherwise they're probably underwater in the Viking Age. Um, OK, so I'm almost done. So conclusions so far are that with experimental archaeology, we can uncover a lot of wisdom, a lot of kind of practical knowledge that people had at the time, but it's very difficult to translate into data because it's all about judgment and kind of subjective measurements and subjective proportional measurements and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that it requires kind of groundbreaking afterwards. So all I'm saying here is these could be used. I can't be certain about any of this yet, of course. Um, and in terms of the, the kind of seafaring worldview, it's clearly very contingent. It's very based on what are the circumstances right now. It's very sequential. You think about places in a line. And it's very relational in terms of, OK, if this lines up with that, then I'm probably here. You know, you're thinking about places in terms of other places and often thinking about people in terms of other people as well, which is interesting. Um, the voyages themselves, I think people often think of them not as, OK, I'm going A to D, but rather I'm going A with B, C, D and E as different alternative routes. And you don't know which one you're going to hit until often quite late in the in the game. Um, with the route choice being determined by a kind of collective judgment of perceived risk. 
Um, but also with a lot of parallels in other places, and this is something that I'm working on at the moment, is looking at, okay, what, what sides of this worldview can we see elsewhere? So we're doing a little sneak peek project in Greenland at the moment, um, looking at potential sailing routes up the west coast of Greenland to harvest ivory, which seems to be coming from much further north than we previously thought. But that is very not published and not just mine, so won't say anymore. And I think I'll stop there. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing your screen. And I don't know whether the people online can unmute their microphones or not, or whether they need Let's do one thing at that time, see what happens. Yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah. There we go. Okay. And then I might have a seat here. And someone's got a hand up. Yes, that's Monica. Yes. <laughs> and you got some. So, Monica, can, can you speak, Monica? Does that work? Or. Oh, Lynn was clapping too, she said. <laughs> Thank you. So in order to speak, there are three dots at the top. Then you choose settings, and you choose meeting options, and then you do something. It's worked as well. Yeah, it's worked. For them. For you. Well, I think we have to... Oh, we have to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three dots we at the top. Control. Settings. Yeah. We need this uh, is meeting options. Meeting options, yeah. And then microphones about halfway down the list. Ah, uh, hello. hello. Hello, camera. Oh, yeah. Hello, Hello folks. Fiona has muted, unmuted the yeah. mic so folk can ask questions if they want. Yay. Yes. Oh, Monica wanted to clap rather than. OK, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. OK, but so people can speak. All right. So thank you. Fantastic. Um, I have made you notes. Know, so that's, that's great. I have lots of questions, but maybe other people have questions too. I think Peter seems to be. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that was super interesting. So thank you very much. Um, I I'm interested in this sort of idea of a inner and an outer room mm. on the coastline mm. because, um, as you were saying, that comes up in the Hebrides, mm. and it's also in Norway and in the sagas they refer a lot to the inner and yeah. the outer room. Yeah. But what what you've done seems to suggest these are more like a guide. Route and you have to adapt it yes, quite, yeah, for sure. quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the idea with, at least in Norway, the idea with the inner and the outer route is that it's a balance, right? Because if you take the outer route, you get stronger winds, but you also get much more waves, and that often means that people get seasick. So when I've talked to people about it, they, they always say, well, you've got to kind of choose how much, you, how much waves and seasickness can you take? for the price of that win you know so so it you do i think you do kind of go back and forth along your route a little bit um but there are there is a specific route at least from buhon to Bolsa, which is just north of Trondelag, all the way to Lofoten, which is very far out um to take kind of maximum advantage of the wind which would probably be used in the bigger boats which can kind of deal with big waves more um and then and then an inner route for when it's rough weather and you want to be protected and have kind of easy access to the shore, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Are there questions in the room or? I ask one. Yeah. What you were saying about tacking being really hard, mm -hmm. does that mean when the wind's against you, you need to go into the outer mood? And so it becomes a even more of a gamble, but. Yeah. Was... Yeah. I mean, I'm obsessed with tacking, <laughs> but but it is very hard. But you you can do things to make it easier. And so what we're doing there is we're, we're tacking with the current, and that makes a huge difference because your boat is drifting the way you want it to go whilst you're kind of backing up, for example. Um, um, but I think also a lot of the tacking trials that have been published until now have been done in very brief experiments with people who are perhaps not super experienced. And so the results they've gotten are often worse. And I, I have done a comparison, which I haven't shown here, of that those tacking trials with stuff that's been published before. We've actually performed better there. Um, but definitely in the sagas, there's often um, people saying, well, the wind is against me just the fly before the wind, basically. And then you just have to drift out with the wind behind you and hope you'll hit something. And we never got that far, <laughs> never got that bad. But in some cases, we were kind of tacking in towards a harbor and it just would not work. And then we just had to change and go somewhere else. 
but we were able to change our course by kind of less than 90 degrees rather than the full 180 and go backwards. Um, and that was enough to get us somewhere else. Um, but yeah, I think in some cases people did just kind of go off with the wind and see what it did them. Yeah. Oh, can you keep on the chat? Yeah. Can I? Yes, I can keep on the chat. There we go. Um, okay. Shall I read these? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, Joan McKinn says, "Fab research. Did you devise a set of key characteristics from this research which you feel can determine havens or landing sites?" Uh, yes, and that's kind of the list that I put up there. Is is these places where you have kind of good protection in all directions, but the possibility to exit from there in as many directions as possible as well. And that's why exposed islands, I think, are really important. Um, places that are linked on the route, so they're not kind of just these exposed fishing stations kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and with some way of loading and unloading people or animals or goods or whatever it happens to be. And ideally fresh water as well. That, that would be my kind of top, top list, I'd say. Um, did you analyze the impact of the wind on landing, mooring, and launching? Interested to see how that impacted. Um, it's just, it's more difficult. <laughs> I don't think I've done any specific uh, experiments with that. No, no. You, you, you try and kind of sail up into the wind when you moor so that your boat stops, and then, and then you kind of cast the rope and, and, and hope you land safely enough. That's kind of as far as I've gone, I'd say. Uh, yes, that's all from here. Yes. First students and then I'll never get it. I did already have one question, but never mind. Uh, just because you mentioned water there, um, I w I'm actually really curious how much water to, does a crew sort of go through when sailing? So <laughs> how often do you have to stop? Would you have to yeah, stop yeah. to resupply on water? That depends a lot on the kind of boat, especially. I know that Morton Raum in Ruskinda, they've done trials with a long ship where there's like 60 people on board, and they sometimes need to go on land three yeah. times a day to wow. shop the water, which is okay. crazy. Most of the trials I've done are with kind of more merchant fishing esque vessels um, with crews of, I think the maximum we've been is 14. Um, and there, first of all, you have a cargo hold where you put stuff, um, but it's a smaller crew as well. But yeah, I mean, you've got to count on kind of three liters per water per purpose per day, and sometimes you're out for three or four days at a time before you yeah. need to go back to land. So, so yeah, a lot. <laughs> um, and I think traditionally with beer on board as well, um, that would be even more probably. So, so yeah, lots of liquid. Mm -hmm. In terms of havens, thinking about fleets rather than individual boats, yeah, yeah. what are your thoughts on a fleet of 60 yeah. ships and how, you know, how are they, like, are they going to be dispersed across a larger area mm. because the mm. havens aren't large enough mm. for that kind of thing? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's why I wanted to show you some uh, different scales a little bit, because I think, for example, Stuart now that that's reported in the Middle Ages of being an anchorage for the fleet as well. Like, so you could get 60 objects in there without too much trouble. But some of them are much, much smaller, definitely. And, and I think like kind of more kind of Ruindunan style, um, where you get smaller boats using it. Um, so so the coordination with the big fleet is a huge question. And we've done, we did some trials with kind of seven or eight boats at the same time. Even then it's a nightmare. Um, so normally what ends up happening is you have a very experienced crew in the first boat and they make all the, the decisions and kind of test that out the conditions as well um, and then manage to communicate back, OK, we're going to go here, watch out for the wind over here, watch out for the current here. Um, that's how we managed to do it. And I think that's kind of where the idea of flagships come from originally as well, as you have the kind of most experienced people at the beginning at the start of the group um, and everyone else kind of struggling along the way. Um, but yeah, definitely, if you're if you're in a place where the, all the harbors are smaller, then you have to kind of spread out. And that creates a whole different logistical nightmare. Yes? Um, one more question here, which says, which was your fave style of boat that you found easiest to handle on the sea? I really like the Femboning, which is the bigger one that I showed in the attacking video, um, because it's kind of at the smaller end 
of what the cargo boats in the Viking Age would have been, like the building. Um, but it's kind of manageable with a crew of, if you have four or five people who are experienced, it's very manageable. You don't want to row them though, because that's very hard. Uh, but yeah, I think those, that's a really good equivalent for, for studying Viking Age sailing. Definitely. I have a question. Yes. Have you sailed at night? Yes. So I showed some photos yes. from that. Yeah, where we sailed. Uh, that day we sailed through the night, actually. Um, yeah, a couple of times. Definitely doable in the summer. Um, one of the reasons I'm so skeptical about instruments is because we didn't see a star the entire night. Well, this <laughs> kind of the question is how do you navigate? Yeah, at night? but because the sky is the light, you yeah. can still see in the shape the of the mountains. Yeah. So, so that worked obviously it's impossible today to not look at the lighthouses and yes. not use the lighthouses yeah. so so there is definitely a, a kind of uh, problem with my authenticity there and and you can't deliberately ignore the lighthouses because that would be very dangerous um so so you are forced to navigate in a modern way to an extent but you can still appreciate that it could be done if you knew the area and i think that's the thing is is you have to have um, at least some people who know where they're going um, because you need to look out for the right shapes and the right kind of sea conditions and everything. So, but yeah, but yeah, definitely, definitely doable. Um, at least on bigger boats. And that's the other thing is you need, if you're going to sail through the night, you need space for half food to sleep. Um, and so you can't sail through the night on the smaller boats because there's nowhere to sleep. So that says, that makes a kind of big difference in terms of the, uh, kind of operational operational radius of the bigger boats versus the kind of smaller what you might have on your average farm kind of thing. Yes. But you also need quite a large or decent red light, but you couldn't do it in. It pitch black would be very difficult. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Um, no, I think I think if you're going to sail at night, you would do it because the conditions were ideal and you wouldn't want to stop. So the further north, the better the in better. the summer. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, daylight. Yeah, exactly. Which makes the kind of winter fishing expeditions all the more mind blowing. Is they they would go up in January, <laughs> which is not only horribly <laughs> cold, but also you've got six hours of daylight, and they're travelling three hundred fifty nautical miles there and three hundred fifty nautical miles back, um, which is crazy to me. I think it's yeah, amazing. But, yeah, it works. Mm -hmm. I think there was another question. Oh. Um, yeah, I was wondering about people. Because yeah. You talked about all this in terms of the land, but there would be people all along that coast. Of course. The yeah. last bit, I guess, if you're going somewhere new, you need to grab a local to join you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the other bit is how much would where people stop depend on. Are there nice people there, or do we want to be found sites? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's another thing that obviously we didn't have to deal with, but this is a kind of militarized zone in the Viking Age. And so you would be want to have a good idea of where the where your friends are. Um, and, and that would influence definitely where you would stop for sure. Um, there hasn't been enough work done on piracy, I think, in the Viking Age in, in Norway, but I think that would be a huge risk as well. And so having some way of avoiding that, at least with the local knowledge, would be super valuable, I think, for sure. And the other bit with people is, isn't there a whole bunch of Roman stuff about all the pirates in the north? So, so yeah. All, all patterns of unpleasantness that you had here. Besides sort of going back to that as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it makes sense. I think, I think one of the things we often forget is that these are extremely poor communities and always have been. And oil has changed that very recently, but until very recently, they, they've always been very poor. So so we, it's kind of opportunity, opportunism of whatever kind. But if a, a fat boat comes down the coast and they don't know where they're going, then you, then you might, kind of, yeah. So just one more bit on that. Yeah. If you then need to have enough people, so you need enough crew to sail your boat, yeah. and you need to deal with anyone who might want to take some. Yeah. So what does that do to the economics of it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And especially in the, the more remote North Atlantic, like in Iceland and Greenland, you're talking a big proportion of the active population. And so one of the big questions is, well, how long can they be away before this is unsustainable? 
And I think it's quite a narrow window in those places, especially maybe six weeks, maybe seven weeks between the kind of um, spring fishing and the harvest. That's your window when you might be able to spare some people. But then everyone needs to be back for harvest because haymaking is such a crucial part of it. Um, so and when that doesn't work and people don't come back, it can really destroy the community, I think. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think some questions in the chat. Yes. Um, Gordon Jones, did any unexpected or interesting onboard social dynamics arise? <laughs> Yes, many. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm saying more than that. <laughs> Privacy yeah. is, not, is not a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and then did you encounter any spots that you would have moved the boat across the sea, perhaps to avoid adverse currents? Yes, we've done that in Denmark a couple of times, which where the landscape is a bit softer. <laughs> um, we dragged the boat across a place called Sayera um, on the west coast of Shalom, and it was 500 meters and it took us half a day basically with kind of 12 people or something um but that was yeah that was mainly done not for adverse current but because the wind was from the north and the boat was on the north coast and it was very wavy um and then were there some havens which would have been more preferable on the approach in bad weather for example than others yeah i mean a lot of these places are difficult to get into if the weather isn't great and that's why i think the multiple entrances is interesting because it gives you more possibilities. Um, approaching land anywhere in bad weather is tricky, um, but there are ways that you can kind of, if you can come around the island and get some shelter from the wind, for example, and then row in, you've got to remember all these boats are rowing boats as well, and that really gives you a lot more possibilities than, than on the kind of pure merchant boat, like the bigger cargo boats and later on. Um, and then Gordon Jones well, rating, but nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so does anybody, while Gordon is typing in the pressure, Gordon, uh, ask a question? Can I ask about rowing? <laughs> well, or are those liable to? You can. It's pretty rough. Um, I know that. Some of the people in Tromsø, some of the boat builders up in Tromsø, they've done some really good trials with smaller rowing boats, which were really impressive. Um, we avoided rowing against the waves whenever possible, but yeah, if if you've got kind of five or six people, you can you can row against the waves. Yeah. So you can make headway against them, but also how vulnerable to tipping are the waves? Um, it's very hard to capsize them. That was one of the things we found out is they're, they're very, very, very buoyant um, and surprisingly stable. So when you reef the sail, for example, you, you have to take the sail down and then tie the reef onto the main yard and then put the sail up again. So at that point, the boat has no momentum and it's just sitting and rocking on the waves. And that's terrifying the first time you do it because you think you're going to capsize and they don't. The reason they capsize is because the sail fills from the wrong side when it's still up and pushes the boat over. If you can get the sail down, or if you don't have a sail at all, then then it's they're quite good at not have something. Yeah. Right. Order. And Gordon says, how transferable would literal sailing skills be to sailing to Scotland, Iceland, etc.? Yeah, that is a good question. I mean, I think. I think this tradition of usage that I'm talking about is primarily coastal sailing originally, which they're then exporting into sailing across the Atlantic to Scotland, England, and wherever else. Um, so I think a lot of the kind of ways of thinking stay the same. Um, but obviously, navigation, some parts of the navigation must have changed. Um, as far as we can tell, they're doing latitude sailing, where you pick a kind of certain place along the west of the coast of Norway and say, if you go west from here, you'll hit X, whether it's Shetland or the Faroes or wherever. Um, and that seems to be quite doable because as long as you can work out where the, when midday is and therefore where the south is from the position in the sun, then um, then you can do that. But, but yeah, there must have been a kind of adaptation there, um, especially as well in terms of supplies because crossing the Atlantic is, is no joke. Um, and you need to have boats that can carry a lot more supplies. <laughs> yes. So can I, can we shut up? <laughs> <laughs> Last question. <Yeah. laughs> so 
great latitude sailing, wouldn't it be as easy to aim 45 degrees off? And if you had the experience of going, you know, well, from here, if I head yeah. southwest, then I will hit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, latitude sailing primarily because it's easier to work out a 90 degree angle than a, than a kind of 135 degree angle. So, so if you if you go off from Bergen and you work out that the sun is there south, you can do that and work out where west is. That is a bit similar, a bit easier. And also because there are place names on the west coast of Norway that seem to be linked to Scotland, Shetland especially, and they are they line up more or less with where Shetland is. Um, I think that's the main one. But you do get, in the sagas, you get these kind of really weird convoluted descriptions of how to do that. So there is a possibility that they're doing something more complex. But I think in terms of pure simplicity, that's, that's the easiest way. Right. That's it, the stuff says Gordon. I think we all agree with that. It's 12 o'clock, so I think we should maybe finish now and uh, we can keep chatting to you because we're, we're going for lunch. But uh, um, thank you, everybody, and monitors. Thank you for interesting presentation. Uh, I think there are many people who are really interested in what, what you say, and I know that's both from Joanne, her PhD is on sort of pilgrimage and, and seafaring, so I think, she, sure. you know, she might, I don't know, I mean, if you're okay and people contact you, yeah, of course. With questions. Of course. Um, yeah. Um, so, yes, thank you so much, and thanks everyone for coming, and you can watch it again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I will close this yeah. now. Uh -huh.